And uh, these guys are going to help me out a little bit, starting now. So um, this evening, from my book Unbroken, my friends and I will perform two poems. The first poem, set 60s years ago in small town Alberta, is Outliers. It was 1961 in a small prairie town, and the 50s were still hanging on, held back by the dirt farmer culture, born long ago and not ready to change. A town of dirt streets and pickup trucks, of small shops and unbending beliefs. A world firmly grounded in the past, until summer brought the outsiders. The lake was popular with tourists all summer. Once known as Snake Lake, now Sylvan Lake. Nine miles long, but not wide, I recall. Shallow at the shore and quite far out, and a long sand beach at the south end between the downtown and the water. Thick weeds in the water near the shore where leeches wait to dine on boys' blood. Population got 10 times bigger each summer. When outsiders filled the streets and beach and Lakeshore Drive became a fairground, midway rides and hucksters on each corner. Crowds big enough for a boy to hide, unseen for just a while, and feel safe. An outsider among outsiders, streets alive with carnival magic. After grade seven, my family moved again. Always the new kid, always alone. It was time once more to make new friends. Hard in a school from grade eight to 12, kids brought by bus from towns near and far. That first summer surreal on Lakeshore, serene in the sunshine on the beach, this boy not sure it's a dream or nightmare. Starting over again in Sylvan Lake was hard. In grade eight, I didn't make close friends. Hung out with kids my age at lunch break shared some time, but were gone by a day's end. This school put me in the youngest group, down from the middle grade and junior high, and older bu bullies sat easy prey, like me as a new boy and Ricky. Ricky wanted to be a rock and roll hero. I just longed to fit in if I could. Ricky dressed in the rock and roll style, long blonde hair teased into a ducktail, clothes the essence of Jean Vincent Cool. Standing in the shadows, I stood out, always the outsider looking in, the new kid who never felt welcome. I'm not sure how Ricky and I had met that fall. But we saw something in each other, shared deep inside and became best friends. He the flash and me there in the shadows. Perfect prey for the high school bullies and the beatings that were sure to come after school and even on weekends, whenever they tracked us down. During the winter, Ricky and me turned 14. Little changed, but a new year began, without promise and cold as before. School closed for a week in December after the well froze in a cold snap. Then nothing much happened until spring and Ricky and me breathed easier, though we knew the bullies were waiting. It was 1961 in this small-minded town and the 50s were still hanging on, held back by the dirt farmer culture. Born long ago and not ready to change, a town of dirt streets and pickup trucks of small shops and unbending beliefs, a world firmly grounded in the past. And Ricky and me were not welcome. It was never one bully, but a gang of toughs caught up and circled me after school. One against one was thought a fair fight, except one was 17 years old, and the other just a boy of 14. And when the bully tired, he stepped out, made way for another to step in, keep on fighting the boy one-on-one. -on -one. 
there'd no be no such one-on-one -on -one fair fight for Ricky. If the bully saw me as weak prey, Ricky was someone perfect to hate. Too pretty in his rock and roll way. A fairy like their dads would beat up on a Saturday night drunken whim. Homo queer, they called him all the names. Beat him up, though he was none of these. Who said this is the winter of our discontent? Got our world just right that cold winter. Fourteen years old and living in fear. Drawn to each other by circumstance. Bullied and beaten by too many. Not able to fit in with the rest. Our own small society of two. Just boys and ever so alone. It was spring when the boys caught me in the schoolyard. Caught me unawares in the lunch break. Circled around by one pushed and hit me. Egged on by others in the circle. Nothing for me to do but fight back. He didn't hear the circle's shouted tips. I heard them and beat him to the ground. Teachers stopped me or I'd have killed him. Later that spring, Ricky was found I'm dead in the woods. His killers never brought to justice. Police worked short and sweet and case closed. Who killed him was not a mystery. Ricky had been tracked and beaten to death. And I could do nothing about it. A 14-year-old boy on his own, haunted by a circle of bullies. It was 1961 in a small-minded town, and the 50s were still hanging on, held back by its dirt farmer culture born long ago, and not ready to change. A town of dirt streets and pickup trucks, of small shops and unbending beliefs, a world firmly grounded in the past, where evil waits to dine on boys' blood. In the summer, my family moved again. It was time once more to make new friends, always the new kid, always alone, just wanting to fit in if I can. And with a new school came new dangers, but I had changed and cannot forget my friend found and lost in a moment who could have been a rock and roll star. This is Susan. The Lake, 1973. I stand at the end of this long wood dock looking across the lake's emerald calm, set among pine-furred mountain guardians under a sky as blue as her eyes were once. Behind me the hill curves upward softly, rolling rock face softened by shallow soil spotted with scrub among soft wild grasses to where my cabin backs up to the woods. At times in this silence I think of her, pale blue summer dress blowing in the breeze. Here beside the lake smiling and waiting, fading away as early morning mist. Legend says there's no bottom to this lake, where spirits rise with the first morning light, are seen by those who most need to see them, are felt near even when the mist has gone. From my cabin porch, when the light is bright, I almost see specters rise through the mist, wavering forms that look almost human, but mostly I sense that Susan is near. Between blue, clear blue sky and emerald lake, these mountains are islands far from the world where whispering winds may ease troubled minds. Yet still I see Susan in waking dreams. The Boys, 1964. As a teen, I set pins and clean washrooms in the Chinook Center's bowling alley, scour grills nights and weekends next door at the sidewalk coffee shop in the mall. Friends plan robberies they never commit. I don't build or explode bombs I design. Mein Kampf and Das Kapital are my texts, all in our afternoon coffee shop class. At the next table, cats post of luring gay young barbers to bash in back alleys. Ex-soldier brags he watched his colonel rape a private, then blackmailed him for silence. 
We young poets and painters test the line, never cross over to the other side. Our game only to prove we could do it. I take my books back to the library. Susan, 1969. Walking down 8th Avenue, I see her. A woman I know from work or somewhere. Hello, Jimmy. As she gets closer to me, and I say hello too and walk on by. I'd remember a woman this beautiful walking into the bookstore where I work, buying a book or browsing the tables, but nothing tells me she was ever there. Now I can't stop thinking of this woman who greets me by my name, then disappears, swallowed up by the busy downtown street while I walk further along 8th Avenue. City Life, 1968. The sun seems to whisper, wake up, Jimmy. I roll over to avoid the bright light, glad to be able to sleep until dawn after six months in a northern work camp. It's a hard life working in the oil fields, grunt work from before dawn to after dusk, sleep in the bunkhouse with other young men. Worth it when a man can be paid so well. Back home in Calgary with six months pay, I bought my new Mustang with oil field cash. Or next week, a, bl a blur of drinking and girls. Got smart and got a job as cash renter. Once broke, some juggers went back to the brakes, to a bunkhouse blues and hard work in the fields. But I've managed to not blow all my wad, keep the Mustang, and a job selling books. I started writing poems during old field nights, stuck in the bunkhouse with not much to do, odd for a dropout who hated high school. The words just came and I wrote them down. Young poets came to the store and hung out, talked about readings in downtown cafes, asked me to come and read my own poems, my stories of the woods and the oil rigs. In cafes, I read of heaven and hell, forests of pine and forests of derricks, my gateway to a new world of wonders, where the poets listen and accept me. Susan, 1969. Quiet talk washes over the cafe, hushes as, as I take my place on stage, begin reading to the usual crowd. Then I remember her as she walks in. I stammer a bit as I read my set, carried away by eyes blue as the sky. Wonder if a reading is where we met. Look up just to see her walk out the door. Like a ghost, the woman is gone again. This woman who knows my name from somewhere. I should remember, though I don't know why. She haunts me even when she is not here. The Cabin, 1972. I, I leave the highway onto the dirt track, into pine woods, then turn in my driveway, park the car where it ends near the cabin, carry my load from that point to the dock. I feel at home in this lakeside cabin, bought in 1969 by oil field savings, to escape the pressures of the city, be forgiven in the peace of the lake. My rowboat breaks the lake's placid surface, draws lines like fish bones along the water to where I stop the boat at the center, do what I must, then sit a while longer. Once back at the dock, I tie up the boat, watch the last of the sunset, sunrise over the lake, take a last look across the green water, drive back to town in a reverent mood. The Chat, 1969. Like a James Stewart romantic movie, Susan and I meet by chance on the street, collide, and all her parcels go flying. After apologies, we change name, trade, change, trade names and talk. Late in the fall, I finally met her. Coffee and chat in a downtown cafe, all the usual getting to know you, Jimmy and Susan together at last. I still don't know where I've met her before, but suppose it doesn't really matter. Susan and I spend our best time together, days and evenings of life in the present. 
The here and now is good enough for me. The past will wait a time to let it out, set Susan free from what she fears the most. While now she's still a mystery to me. The Fall, 1971. She's still magic to me after four years. Susan of the soft blue eyes and deep soul. Secrets in her past that she can't reveal. Won't tell even to her longtime lover. Even now, Susan keeps her past to herself. Between us, a wall I can't get past. At times I see terror, too, in her eyes, created by things she may see or hear. Susan still resists living together, keeps her apartment close as her secrets, looks over her shoulder far too often. Nothing I could do from behind the wall. Fear, 1972. Something happened as the new year began. Terror overcame Susan's state of mind as shadows of her past came to haunt her where she hid behind a wall of secrets. Fear seemed to build a newer, higher wall at last to shut me out almost completely. Not able to free Susan from her past, not able to help her in the present. One argument, too many over secrets, too many words said in haste and anger. Susan left my life quiet as she'd come, without fanfare or goodbye, she was gone. It was as though she had never existed. The phone she never answered was cut off. Rent never paid to hold her apartment. Her work called the police with concern. The Favor, 1972. When Susan had asked me one last favor, I resisted, though Susan's mind was made up to go ahead with or without my help and I couldn't let her go it alone. Susan and I sat and talked all that night until Susan slept while I held her hand, waiting for the first morning light to come, then took Susan with me to the cabin. The Lake, 1973. Standing at the end of the dock at dawn, watching the sky and early light turn blue, my thoughts turned to city night images, the blue of Susan's eyes and her blonde hair. Looking out over the lake just at dawn, I see Susan sometimes, or think I do, the lady of the lake there in the mist, rising from the water and gone again. They say the lake is bottomless. They say a body in the lake will sink, but may float up if you wait long enough ghost on the water, then gone forever. Thank you.